peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening from Matthew chapter 17, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. This is our text. In the name of Jesus, dear Christian friends, for just a moment I want you to think back to your school days, if you could. I'd like to ask you who you believed was your favorite teacher. You know, if I had to make a list, uh, each of you make a list of the qualities that you think would make an effective teacher, I'm sure that one of those qualities would first of all be knowledge of the subject. I mean, uh, I mean we want teachers who are experts in their field. Another quality would be the ability to teach the material so that we can understand it. That it's not above our head, that we can understand the words. I guess what I'm saying is that effective teachers not only teach us the material, but they also teach us how to use the material that we have learned in our everyday life. In our text for this evening, we see Jesus once again as the masterful teacher, the most effective teacher. Not only did he have great knowledge of the subject but he, that he was teaching, but he was also perfectly applying what he said to his subjects, to his students. Now, in our reading, the disciples were his students. Tonight, we are his students. And I believe that what Jesus is teaching us this evening is to understand the transfiguration of Jesus and what that means for the next six weeks. For the next six weeks. He is teaching us the meaning of Lent. He teaches us not only that He is the true God, but that He is the promised Messiah that was, was promised for centuries, and finally that He is the only Savior that there is. Our reading for tonight is taken from Matthew 17. This is the time in Jesus' public ministry when he is teaching his disciples that they're going to go to Jerusalem and there Jesus was going to suffer and be crucified and then he would rise again on the third day. And Jesus wasn't just telling them a story here. He was impressing on them exactly what it meant to be the promised Savior of the world. Well, his disciples did not take his words very well. He didn't, they didn't take it well that Jesus was going to have to die. In fact, when Jesus tells them that he, what's going to happen to him, Peter takes him aside and he says, Lord, there's no way that we're going to let this happen to you. But Jesus kept teaching them. He kept preparing them for what was going to happen in just less than a year. Now, this Wednesday is the beginning of the church season that we call Lent. Now, in Lent, we are going to hear about how Jesus was betrayed, how he was beaten and tortured and executed on the cross, and how he was buried in a tomb. And you know, there's a lot of people who just want to kind of rush through the season of Lent because they don't want to hear about such cruelty to their Savior. Kind of like the disciples of Jesus in our text. But we have to hear about it. We actually have to see it with our eyes of faith so that we can realize what Jesus did for us and what it means for us. And our text for this evening teaches us the big picture of Lent. Why we celebrate and rejoice even though Jesus had to suffer for us. You see, the transfiguration of Jesus, very familiar story to all of you, I'm sure, but it sets up Lent. It reminds us who Jesus is, that he is the true God. Now Matthew tells us in our text, Jesus was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. 
Mark and Luke, the other gospel writers, they also describe Jesus as being as bright as lightning. His clothes were whiter than anyone in the world could ever bleach them. You know, some people have tried to explain away this event on the Mount of Transfiguration by saying that Jesus' disciples, they were, well, they were just dreaming or they were hallucinating. But all that does is deny the power of the Holy Word of God. In fact, 30 years later, 30 years later, Peter is still reeling from his experience. Peter insisted on the event on that mountain wasn't any hallucination when he said in our epistle reading for this evening, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for, for we were with him on the holy mountain. John, who was also on the mountain that day, wrote, we have seen his glory, the glory as the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So what exactly was this transfiguration all about? Well, it's like this. As the Son of God, Jesus had divine glory from all eternity. But for his 33-year ministry on the earth, he didn't use that power. He didn't show his divine glory. He looked just like any other man. Well, he, I know, he, he used it once in a while when he was doing miracles that he performed. But those miracles were only done to back up the words that he spoke so that people would believe in him. But on that mountain of transfiguration in our text, Jesus shows who he really is by letting that divine glory shine through. And why? Again, it was to teach. It was to encourage the disciples that in spite of all the things that are going to happen to him in the coming year, his upcoming suffering and death, he was still in control of everything. And that it was all being done for their salvation. You see, that's what I want all of us to remember as we go through these next six weeks of Lent. That Jesus is indeed the Almighty God. But Jesus goes on to teach. He teaches us that he's also the promised Old Testament Messiah. Now, how do we know this? Well, our text tells us that Moses and Elijah show up on the mountain. And they start to talk with Jesus. Now, the fact that Moses and Elijah were there, and those two particular prophets, well, that's very important. You see, the Gospel of Luke tells us that they were there speaking with Jesus about his departure, which was about to take place in Jerusalem. In other words, they were talking about, to Jesus about his upcoming death. So why was it Moses and Elijah who appeared to Jesus on the mountain? Well, Moses was a prophet through whom God gave the law, summed up in the Ten Commandments as we heard in our Old Testament reading for tonight. And God is very serious about his law and demands that we keep his law perfectly in our thoughts and in our words and in our deeds, just like we confessed our sins a moment ago and said in thought, word, and deed. But even Moses, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, couldn't even come close to keeping the law of God perfectly. So what did Moses do? Moses pointed the people, his people, to the coming Savior, the promised Messiah. This Messiah was going to keep God's law perfectly, and then he was going to die for the sins of the whole world. That's why Moses was up on that mountain with Jesus and his disciples. But what about Elijah? Well, Elijah was just another great prophet who testified to the coming of God's Savior. He was one, the one who won great victories for God's people. He was also the one whom God took straight up to heaven without having, his, having to see death. That's why Elijah was there. You see, Moses and Elijah represented the whole Old Testament scriptures of God's plan of salvation and prophecy. And Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem right now to fulfill those prophecies, to fulfill what Moses and the prophets had spoken about him as the Savior of the world, the promised Messiah. 
So it's only proper that in that glorious moment that Jesus would be visited by the very ones who spoke about him in the past. Jesus lived that perfect life that our Lord requires of us. And so he earned for us the gift of everlasting life. He willingly went to the cross as our substitute and was beaten and whipped and eventually executed. But remember, Jesus is true God. And so he was in control of all of that. In fact, this was his whole purpose in coming into the world. That's what he was telling his disciples. That he would go to Jerusalem, he would be arrested, and tried and crucified and on the third day he would rise again. He suffered our punishment of hell and in turn gave us the forgiveness of all of our sins and a right standing before our Heavenly Father. He invites all people through his word to repent of their sins and believe in him as their Savior. Through faith, these blessings of eternal life and forgiveness, they become ours personally. And so in the transfiguration of Jesus, we get to see a glimpse of that eternal life that Moses and Elijah talked about during their lives. And we see a glimpse of what, was going, what was, we're going to share with Jesus in heaven for all eternity. Moses and Elijah showing up on that mountain it was proof to us that there is life beyond the grave. What blessings we have now and what blessings we have to look forward to. But these blessings only come one way, and that's through Jesus. Our text tells us that Peter was still speaking, and behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now that cloud has really, really kind of got me when I was studying for this text. You know, that cloud seems to show up a whole lot of times in the Old Testament. I mean, the Lord led Israel through the desert after leaving Egypt. And by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. That's what it says in Exodus chapter 13. At Mount Sinai, the Lord confirmed his covenant with Israel and the cloud covered the mountain. And to the Israelites below, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. You heard that in our Old Testament. Later in Exodus, we hear that God appeared as a cloud. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, the people of Israel would move on to their next stop in the desert. And finally, when Solomon dedicated Israel's permanent temple in Jerusalem, Build the temple of the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 8. So the cloud here in our reading is very important because it shows that our Lord was moving his plan of salvation another step forward, one step closer to the cross. The voice from the cloud was God the Father, and he repeated some of the same words that he said at Jesus' baptism. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But here he adds, listen to him. And this was the fulfillment of one of Moses' prophecies. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. How appropriate it was for the Father to say this. Many people in Jesus' time and in our times today have no time for Jesus and don't care about what he has to say. We hear, the, we hear from all kinds of people today that things like all religions are all the same. They're basically the same. All people worship the same God. They just call him by different names. Hey, that's not true. That's not true. People need to know that Jesus is the one and only Savior that this world is ever going to have. It wasn't Buddha. It wasn't Muhammad who appeared with Jesus on that mountain. It was Moses and Elijah who testified to Jesus as the Son of God and as the Savior of the world. Since Jesus is our only Savior, we have to listen to what he says. Even Jesus said that the scriptures all testify about him. 
Let's get into those scriptures. Let's study those words. Let's learn about what our God has done for us in Jesus and how we can live for him right now. Let's dig into his word every day with our eyes of faith and believe and accept what Jesus has said. What a master teacher Jesus is. In our text for this evening, Jesus taught his disciples the true meaning of Lent. What a lesson he teaches us today. We get to rejoice in the next six weeks of Lent that our Savior died for us and that he rose again from the dead. He teaches us that he is the true God, that he is indeed the promised Messiah, and that he's the only Savior we'll ever need. Our Lenten series for this year is going to focus on the last words of Jesus from the cross. I'm going to be here on Wednesday of this week to speak that last word of Jesus. Kind of interesting to start Lent with the last word of Jesus on the cross, it is finished. We invite you to join us for that time of worship. We ask that the transfiguration of Jesus will set us up for the blessed message of Jesus crucified, yes, but then risen from the dead for your salvation and mine. We ask this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And now we